In your Bibles, if you please turn with me to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2. And this morning our text will just be two verses in Luke chapter 2, verses 10 and 11. This message could be called the Christmas Confession. In Luke 2, verses 10 through 11. But the angel said to them, and this is to the shepherds. The angel said to them, do not be afraid. For behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. For today in the city of David, there has been born for you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. The confession is focusing on these three titles given to Jesus. For this day has been born in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. So the aim today is that we'd have understanding of the importance of these three titles given to Jesus. His name is Jesus. The titles, Savior, Christ, and Lord. That was in that glorious good news that night that the angel delivered to the shepherds, those lowly shepherds. Well, the first title is Savior. And we see this in the calling of his name in Matthew chapter 1, verse 21. His name shall be called Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. He's the Savior. The word Savior means to deliver. To deliver. Every one of us sitting here in, the, in this room here today, we were born with a major problem. A problem greater than any health uh, issue that you could ever imagine. And the problem was, every one of us was born with a sin problem. Amen? Amen. That means that we were born with a need to be rescued. To be delivered. To be saved. And Jesus Christ, because nobody, no man on this earth could do the saving. That's why Jesus Christ came down, put on flesh, went to the cross. He was obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross, to save us. The meaning, his meaning, Savior. The name comes from the Hebrew name, I put Joshua, but it's Yeshua, which would be the Hebrew form. Yahweh is salvation, is the meaning of the name. The Greek, and off the Greek we have the word, the name Jesus. His mission. He will save his people from their sins. We even see in Galatians 4, 4 and 5, the Apostle Paul writes that Jesus Christ would be born under the law. He's, he's made of a woman, born of a woman, made under the law. Why? To redeem them that are under the law. To redeem. The meaning, he will save his people from their sins. Warren Wearsby in a little book written in 1980, The Wonderful Names of Jesus, he wrote the following. He came to do a work that only heaven could do. Salvation. He came to do the work that only heaven could do. Save lost sinners. Salvation is of the Lord because no man can save himself. That's the truth. Every one of us born with a need to be saved, to be rescued because of being born into sin. Jesus said in Luke 19, 10, for the Son of Man, he came to seek and to save that which was lost. We have the confession of the men of Sychar. 
Remember Jesus talking to the woman of Samaria? They're at the well. And the woman of Samaria says, and, and Jesus starts talking to her and gets her to the point of need. And Jesus says, go call your husband and come here. And the woman says to the Lord, I have no husband. And Jesus said, you have rightly said that you have no husband, for you've had five husbands, and the one that you are with now is not your husband, in that you have spoken truly. But Jesus was getting to a point of need. Here was a broken woman. And Jesus was going to offer her living water. But what's the reaction of this dear woman there in Samaria that has come at the hottest point of the day, not when the other women came to draw the water. She was rejected. She was an outcast. So as she comes to the water, to get the water, and Jesus has talked to her about the living water, she leaves her pots and goes back and runs into Samaria and says, to the, back into the city and tells there's a man that has told me everything that I've ever done. Could this be the Christ? Could this be the Messiah that we're waiting on? It's in that context that Jesus tells the apostles that are there, he says, oh, look up. The fields are already white for harvest. It looked like as the turbans and as the men coming toward him. It looked like a field of white. And Jesus said, lift up your eyes. Those men, they came. In John chapter 4, I'm just going to summarize some of this and it will say that the men are saying to the woman, no longer have we, are we believing because of what you have said, but we have heard him ourselves. We've heard Jesus and believed, and we recognize he's the Savior of the world. The men of Sychar said that in John chapter 4. Their confession was that he is the Savior of the world. He came to save his people from their sins. You have the confidence of the apostles. We were talking about this in Sunday school class, about the difference of those apostles. Once the Holy Spirit came to live within them, to abide within, and how they witnessed and spoke with boldness the power because of the working of the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 5, verses 27 to 32, they've been in imprisoned and, and they've been released. And the Bible says in verse 27, when they had brought them, they stood them before the council. The high priest questioned them, saying, We gave you strict orders not to continue teaching in this name. And yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. But Peter and the apostles answered, We must obey God rather than men. And the God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you had put to death by hanging him on a cross. He is the one whom God exalted to his right hand as a prince and a savior. He's been exalted as a prince and as a savior to grant repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. Jesus said after the resurrection, he commissioned in Luke 24 the apostles, and he is sending them out, saying that they are to preach a message of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Do you realize that Jesus alone is the Savior. He alone can forgive us of our sins because He went to the cross and died and paid for the penalty that we deserve. He paid our sin debt. The first title, Jesus is the Savior. 
Second of all, he's the Christ. He's the Christ. The word Christ means anointed one. And this is where we get into the threefold office of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. There's two P's and a K. <laughs> he is prophet. He is prophet. Now prophets revealed God to men. That was the role of the prophets. Revealing God to man. In Deuteronomy 18, Moses said there's going to be another prophet that comes. Referring to the Lord Jesus Christ. How do we know the Father? Because the Son has come and revealed Him to us. John 1, 18. He has come and revealed the Father to us. He is a prophet. He is a priest. He didn't come, and His priesthood is not of the Levitical priesthood. No, Jesus is the priest after the order of Melchizedek. Hebrews chapter 5. Melchizedek, it's a different order. And he doesn't stop because of death. Like the earthly priest, he gave his life. Priests represent men to God. And Jesus Christ is the compassionate, faithful, high priest. He is a king. He is a king. As we are celebrating the birth of Jesus, he came lowly in a manger. He came. He came to this earth to be the suffering servant. Isaiah 53. That he would die for us. He would take our sins upon himself. Wounded for our transgressions. But he's coming back. His second coming. Revelation 19 says that he will come back as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Oh, when we sing that Christmas song, Joy to the World, you ever catch that one verse that says, He rules the world? with truth and grace. He didn't come the first time to do that, did he? So you know, in that Christmas carol, there's a hint of not only the first coming, but also the second coming. That he's going to come back and rule the king. You will see fulfillment of Isaiah 2. You will see fulfillment of Isaiah 9, 6, and 7. You will see fulfillment of Isaiah 11. You will see fulfillment of Isaiah 60 to 66. And many other passages in Psalm 2. That Jesus Christ will rule the righteous king. But in Revelation 19, every eye shall behold him. Every eye shall see him. And Jesus will come as the triumphant King of kings and Lord of lords. He is King. So the threefold offices of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, He is the Anointed One, He is the, pre, the, the Prophet, Priest, and King. Oh, but there's a third title. And so oftentimes this is missed in the glorious message at Christmas. Jesus is Lord. He is Lord. Unto you this day is born in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Jesus is Lord. Point three on your outline has been adapted from a message by Dr. Adrian Rogers called Jesus is Lord. Dr. Adrian Rogers had an ability that I've never had, and that was on point B, 
he had such an ability to take and so many points of the same letter. <laughs> and, and so that is why I adapted from his message this very point because of the way he communicates it. But first of all, when we think about Jesus Christ as Lord, Acts 2.36 says that God, the Father, has made him both Christ and Lord. That's what Peter preached on the day of Pentecost. He says, you have taken him, and you have crucified him. You've turned him over, and he's been crucified by the hands of godless men. But this same Jesus has been God the Father made him both Christ and Lord. Philippians chapter 2 we saw in verse 8 that Jesus came in the appearance of a man and was obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. He finished the work that he came to do. Jesus said, I have finished, I have completed that work. From the cross to Telestai, it is done, it is finished. The work is completed. Paid in full the debt. He came to do, and he finished. But he rose again. Friend, if Jesus Christ did not rise from the grave, he would not be the Lord of all. But he is. He's the Lord. And it says, because he was obedient to the point of death, because he finished the work, and he rose again the third day, he has been given a name that is above all names, that at the name of Jesus that every knee should bow and every tongue confess. The word confess means to say, to be in agreement, to say the same thing as. To confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. First of all, there must be a settled conviction that Jesus is Lord. There must be a settled conviction. That's who he is. He's Lord. The word Lord, kurios. Kurios. It's deity. He is Almighty God. And as Almighty God, he is the master. Amen. Jesus Christ is Lord. There must be a settled conviction. There is a cost to say, Jesus Christ is Lord. There's a cost to that. All throughout the ages, those at the time of our Lord, or those shortly after those in the early church, the Jews who confessed Jesus as Lord, they were in danger of being labeled heretics and cast out of the temple. To be cast out of the temple meant you don't do business with them. You, you don't buy and sell. You ostracize them. Remember the parents of the man that Jesus healed that was born blind? And the parents were afraid to answer, and he said he's of his age. He will answer for himself. The reason they said that was because they were afraid of being cast out of the temple, of being ostracized. So those that would say, Jesus Christ is Lord, were in danger, and many, they were ostracized. They had a settled conviction. The Gentiles who confessed Jesus as Lord, oh, friend, they would say, Christos Kurios, the Christ, Kurios is Lord. The word Caesar came from kurios. So if they were saying Christos kurios, they were saying Caesar isn't kurios. Caesar's not Lord. Jesus is Lord. We have a king that we bow the knee to and confess, and it's Jesus. And he's the king, he's our Lord. Not Caesar. 
Oh, maybe the Roman emperors would set themselves up to be worshipped. Well, they could be tried for treason, and many were. How many were fed to the hungry lions? Because they had a settled conviction to say, Jesus Christ is Lord. Are there still believers today around the world that face persecution and even death, imprisonment, for the settled conviction to say Jesus Christ is Lord? What about the dear ones that come to know Jesus Christ in Iran today that are ostracized from their family, that are in danger of death, but they have a settled conviction and they say Jesus Christ is Lord? There must be a subtle conviction. It's not Christ and, but Christ or. Catch that? It's not Christ and, it's Christ or. On February the 23rd, 155, a Roman military officer publicly demanded that Polycarp disciple of the Apostle John and the aged pastor of Smyrna renounced Christ. The old pastor's famous reply has echoed throughout history. Eighty and six years have I served him, and he has done me no wrong. Can I revile my king that saved me? I'll throw you to the beast, shouted the Roman. Polycarp told him to bring them on. Then I'll have you burned, the man warned. Polycarp replied, you try to frighten me with fire that burns for an hour, and you forget the fire of hell that never goes out. An hour later, his body was ashes, his soul was Christ. He had a settled conviction that Jesus Christ is Lord. A settled conviction. Friend, there must be a steadfast confession that Jesus Christ is Lord. A steadfast confession. To confess, to agree, to speak in that agreement that Jesus is Lord. What does a steadfast confession do? Well, would you turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10? What does a steadfast confession that Jesus is Lord do? Actually, we'll begin in verse 8 of Romans 10. First of all, it shows salvation. The Bible says, but what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. These verses are going to talk about two very important places. The mouth and the heart. You know, there are some today that are critical of saying, of saying, inviting Jesus Christ or asking Christ into your heart. Well, I see a lot that the Bible talks about the heart being the center of man. And so when I see that, and, and we're going to see in these verses, there's the focus on the heart. The Bible says, but what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we are preaching. That if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart a person believes resulting in righteousness. And with the mouth he confesses resulting in salvation. A steadfast confession shows salvation. Shows salvation. Second of all, a steadfast confession that Jesus is Lord subdues Satan. Hebrews chapter 2 
The Bible says, Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same, that through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and might free those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. Do you realize that Hebrews chapter 2 is a Christmas passage? That Jesus Christ came to this earth. Why? To render powerless the enemy of our souls because he conquered grave. And because of him and because he rose again, we don't have to fear death. We could face death as Polycarp said there in the midst even of persecution. He was saying, I know where I'm heading. He said, as the Apostle Paul did, to be absent from the body, to be present with the Lord. I know I'm going to spend eternity with my Lord. So whatever you're going to do, you can go ahead and do it. This body's temporary, but I'm going to go into the eternity with my Lord. Subdue Satan. A third thing that the steadfast confession that Jesus Christ as Lord does, strengthen saints. First Peter, Peter is writing to believers that are suffering. And there's more persecution coming. And here's the reality. Throughout the church history, there were those in the Roman Colosseum waiting as, as it was, sounds odd, but it's horrible. It's entertainment to see the Christians devoured by the hungry lions. But how did they stand strong even at that time in those arenas? Somebody would start to say, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Christos Kurios. Jesus is Lord. They would face the death with the conviction and the confession. And it strengthened the saints. And it still does. Amen? Save sinners. Those shepherds, aren't you glad that they didn't keep that glorious message to themselves? The Bible says they came back, giving a report, telling others. You know what didn't stop those shepherds? Those shepherds didn't say, we're only shepherds. We're ceremonially unclean. We're despised. We're seen as outcasts, so we're not going to say anything. They'll never believe us anyway. No, that's not what it says. Here's the phrase. I don't have it on your notes. It's a good one to write down. Come and see, go and tell. Here's what they did. They obeyed, and they went in a hurry. And they found Jesus Christ. They found. They believed the message. When then, after they had seen Jesus Christ, then they went... And they left there and they were telling others, come and see, go and tell. Boy, it sounds familiar. Isn't that what we're to do? You know, sometimes, you ever have the thoughts, you know, keep silent. Don't talk about Jesus. You don't know enough about the Bible. What if they ask this question? You know what happens? I'm asked questions times that I don't know. I tell them I don't know. I'll do my best to find out. Satan likes to try to convince us, and one of the ways to silence us is to say, you don't know enough. Well, you could be a believer, a serious student of the Scripture. If you, you listen to those lies of being silent, there'll be always some other lie of why not to talk, uh, tell about Jesus. Nothing stopped those shepherds. They left, telling them about Jesus. A fellow I know, 
a tremendous evangelist? Was out on the corn, he was out in the farm, or out in the field, by himself. He accepted the Lord Jesus Christ out there in that field. He took a load to the elevator. He led somebody to the Lord about 15 minutes later. And he would tell you, he didn't know how many books were in the Bible. He didn't know, he didn't have a lot of verses memorized. He would tell you, he couldn't answer the deepest theological questions. But you know what he did? He went and said what exactly had happened to him. <laughs> That's come and see. Go and tell. A steadfast confession saves sinners. Why? 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 18 through 21. I believe these are some of the most powerful verses in the whole New Testament. Now all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ. Don't miss those words. How did he reconcile us to himself? Through Christ. And gave us. It doesn't just say he gave the preacher or he gave the evangelist or he gave so-and-so. It says he gave us. Can you say that us means me? The ministry of reconciliation. Friend, if you know the Savior, he gave you a ministry called the ministry of reconciliation. Namely, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. So he has given us the ministry of reconciliation. He gave us the word. What is it? It's the gospel. It's the very news that Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. That's the glorious message. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were making an appeal through us. We beg you on a behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. He made him who knew no sin to become sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Our sins were placed upon Jesus, so that when we believe on him, that his righteousness is applied to our account. Friend, a steadfast confession, Jesus is Lord, it saves sinners. Because God is working through us. He is pleading with the sinner as the Holy Spirit is speaking to their hearts. The final thing, what does Jesus as Lord, that glorious confession do? It simplifies service. There was a young pastor had went to this church that had been troubled. It was a very large church. And one of the guys in that church had come to this young pastor and said, boy, you're going to have a hard job because you're going to have to satisfy, it was several hundreds of people, you're going to have to satisfy all those people. There's different desires, there's different likes, there's different things that the people want. And, and that young pastor answered wisely, no, you, you have it wrong. My role isn't here to satisfy all of you. My role is this, to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Galatians 1.10, For am I now seeking the favor of men or of God? We're living in a time, friend, when some of the most popular preachers today that are the most well-liked, the, the books sell the most and all this type of thing are teaching a false teaching. One of the largest churches in the United States of America, you will never hear the word sin used in that church. How will the people ever, need to, ever know that they need the Savior? 
How would you like to have a doctor that says, I'll only tell you the good news. If there's something really wrong I find with you, I'm not going to tell you. You'll like me, won't you? But that's what's happening, even in our time that we're living in. Galatians 1.10, Paul says, I'm, am I now seeking the favor of men or of God? Or am I striving to please men? If I were still trying to please men, I would not be a slave of Christ. No, he says, Jesus is Lord, and I'm serving him. Boy, it simplifies service. Simplify service. I want to be obedient to my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Aren't you as born this day in the city of David a Savior? His name is Jesus because he came to save his people from their sins. The Christ, the anointed one, he's the prophet, priest, and king who is the Lord. He died on the cross, was buried, but he rose again the third day. Remember that little chorus that says, he is Lord, he is Lord. He has risen from the grave, and he is Lord. Every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. You may be thinking, well, Pastor, you got the wrong holiday. You're talking about the resurrection. Friend, you can never separate Christmas from why Jesus came. When did, when did he die on that cross? Well, we celebrate his Good Friday, but he rose again on that resurrection day. But when did it all start? as a baby in the manger. Well, going back from eternity past, but here on this earth, as a baby. But he didn't stay a baby, did he? Why did he come? To die on the cross. So as you gather with others, and as the Lord gives opportunity, don't stay at the manger. Go from the manger to the cross, to the resurrection. Because the glorious message is this. He's the Savior who is Christ, the Lord. Will you bow your heads, close your eyes, as we have invitation today? You may have came in here today. There may be a tugging at your heart the Bible says the Holy Spirit convicts. That means convinces. You have a need that you cannot meet yourself. The biggest thing that gets away between me and my salvation would be pride. I can handle it. No, we can't. Jesus Christ came to die on the cross he took your sins upon himself. Friend, you cannot get to heaven on your own. The Bible says we're saved by grace through faith because it's not of works, lest any man should boast. That's why Jesus Christ came. He came to die on that cross. He was buried and he rose again the third day. His name is Jesus. Friend, he died for your sins and mine. Have you said yes to him? The reality is John 1.11 says that he came to his own, came to his own creation, but his own, his own people did not receive him. But verse 12 says, as many as received him, to them he gave the right to be called the children of God, to those who believe on his name. Placing their trust in Jesus alone. Have you done that? 
Maybe you're here today and say, you know, Pastor, I know I'm a believer. I know I have come to that point where I was saved. Do you have that settled conviction that Jesus Christ is Lord? Do you have that steadfast confession that he is Lord? It's not Christ and, it's Christ or. Are you submitting to his lordship? Maybe the Holy Spirit is bringing light somewhere in your life that's not yielded to him. Will you not leave here today without confessing that sin unto the Lord? Bringing it to Him? It starts with a decision. It starts with that commitment. Jesus said, if, you're, if somebody wants to be my follower, my disciple, he's going to have to deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me, living in obedience. Lord, we ask in this invitation, as we sing, thank you, Holy Spirit, that you convict. You convict the world of sin, the sin of unbelief, of righteousness, because Jesus was going to go to the Father, and of judgment, the reality that Satan has been judged at the cross. Thank you for who the Lord Jesus is. Oh, we pray right now in this invitation, have your way in the hearts and lives. May we just respond to you as you would call us to today. In Jesus' name, amen. Will you please stand?